Good afternoon, and welcome to our very first session of the 11th Annual Gathering. To introduce our next speaker is a very important member of Team G, which is the gathering force, Ray Hammond. Ray uh, runs the New York Quarterly Literary Journal, and he also is the person in charge of Keystone College Press, Nightshade Press. So I'm happy to introduce Ray Hammond. Thank you, Charlotte. Good afternoon. Please allow me to begin my introduction of Steve McIntosh with a very brief personal testimony. I first heard Steve McIntosh speak on NPR shortly after his book, Integral to Consciousness and the Future of Evolution, came out. I had just left from visiting my family, settling in for the nine-hour drive back to New York when passing Hollins University on Interstate 81 on the great up Tinker Mountain, Steve's interview came on. Now, I'm very specific about the location, not only because it was such a memorable moment, but because from the great up Tinker Mountain, you can see the bottom of the Shenandoah Valley that is Roanoke, nestled between the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Allegheny Mountains. Growing up there, I had been raised to be very religious and had been taught not to question. But question I did, especially as I got older and eventually escaped. I began in my youth to ask questions such as why was the only acceptable music for the hymnal written between the mid-1800s and early 1900s? <laughs> Why did the more affluent people of the city worship with the more austere religions while the simpler, more blue-collar people in the outlying areas where I lived attend strict Bible-believing churches? And then the people who were mostly farmers one mountain range over yell in tongues and dance in church, and then yet another mountain range removed from the city dance with snakes and drink poison. And while not all of my questions were religious, I knew that the answers had to be bigger than the obvious. Well, things started coming into focus that moment. I found some answers and definitely more questions when I heard Steve McIntosh explaining the evolution of social consciousness. I was and am to this day inspired by his work. I hope that he and the gathering this weekend will equally inspire you with maybe some answers, but more importantly, questions of your own. Steve McIntosh is an American author and president of the Institute for Cultural Evolution think tank. The Institute focuses on the cultural foundations of America's political dysfunction, working to expand the scope of what people can value. Steve has written three influential books on, on integral philosophy that animates the Institute's perspective, Integral Consciousness and the Future of Evolution, Evolution's Purpose, and his most recent, The, the Presence of the Infinite. His work explores the intersection of social development, spirituality, and politics. I'm very pleased to introduce you to Steve McIntosh. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much, Ray, and uh, Charlotte, and Suzanne, and all the gathering team. It's really, uh, I'm really grateful to have to have you bring me here. Really good to be here. I look much better when I wear this coat. <laughs> I'm from uh, Boulder, Colorado, so it's very dry there. And I'm, um, I'm just getting used to the humidity, so you have to pardon me if I just kind of throw this over here and you'll know I brought it. <laughs> so how's that? That's a little bit better? Yeah. Okay. So as is becoming increasingly painfully obvious, uh, we live in a very divided cultural time. And growing out of our divisions, growing out of our political dysfunction is a participatory process. You know, and indeed, it's going to take the entire culture to mature beyond um, the dysfunction that we find ourselves in. So this, this talk, this presentation I'm going to give you is participatory in the sense that I'm going to keep it as short as I can, you know, less than 40 minutes, and then we'll have the second half of the, of the opportunity together to talk about it. So I want you to think in advance of this problem that we're all faced with, a divided culture. So bear with me and just, just close your eyes for just a second and think about how this problem feels. It feels frustrating. It feels vexing. It feels sometimes uh, you know, impossible to overcome. So ask yourself, what's causing this? 
What's, what, how, how can we grow out of it? What, what's, what's the, what are the key leverage points for moving beyond um, a division uh, that really threatens our democracy itself, I think? So when I'm done talking, please, uh, I'm asking you to participate by not just questions, but comments, challenges, really. I hope we can have a lively discussion among us um, once I'm done presenting this material uh, on uh, the work of the Institute for Cultural Evolution. So as Ray said, my work is uh, focused on the evolution of values and how that affects both politics and culture. And after working on this in this field for about a decade, uh, my colleagues and I sort of had a sense, we, had a, we felt a kind of a duty to try to bring some of these ideas uh, to the culture beyond just writing books or, or giving talks. And so we, we uh, gathered together to create um, a fledgling institution, the Institute for Cultural Evolution. And our focus was, we, we, we felt we had a contribution to make in the realm of where, wherever a political or social issue was impacted by the culture war, we felt we could um, make a contribution. So we began the Institute by focusing on climate change, which uh, is certainly a problem that's impacted by the culture war. But after working on climate change for about two years, it became more and more obvious that the underlying problem, um, at least the one that we could contribute to to try to overcome you know, or ameliorate climate change, was this deeper problem of uh, political polarization, hyper-partisan polarization. And so since 2014, that's been the focus of the think tank. We've had a variety of, uh, of high-level conclaves where we've invited political and social leaders together to talk about the subject. Um, we, we evolved that further to beyond just trying to meet in the middle. We thought, well, we're going to need both sides to evolve. So we had uh, conclaves on the future of the right and the future of the left to try to frame uh, a more mature version of, of these political uh, camps. And of course, since the, uh, the 2016 election, um, the, the problem of partisan polarization has become even more severe. So uh, we were working on it, you know, we've been working on it for some years and it keeps getting worse. Maybe we're not doing a very good job, but obviously this isn't um, a kind of a problem that one institution can overcome. Nevertheless, as I'm going to explain in this talk, the political polarization, and indeed the deeper cultural division that's driving the political polarization, has come about as the result of cultural growth, right? We, we, we've become sort of stretched out as a culture, more differentiated than we used to be. And so the idea that we could actually outgrow this problem by cultural maturation is what we're beginning to examine. The famous psychologist Carl Jung is famous for saying that we don't so much solve our problems as we outgrow them. And, and political polarization and indeed the deeper problem of our cultural divisions um, is a problem I think we can outgrow. Um, certainly the results of the 2016 election have exacerbated things. But I think in some ways, um, you know, the Trump administration is, is a symptom rather than a cause of our political divisions. Back in 2014, when we started to engage the subject, many of the experts in the field argued that America as a whole was not intensely polarized. It was that, that we had been sorted into parties, into different camps by the political interests inside the Beltway. But that you know, if you get out of the, the gridlocked Washington scene, then if you go among the country, people are agreed. If we could just get a centrist candidate, or, or if we could just get people to see beyond um, the fractious politics of Washington, then this is something that uh, we could reclaim a vital center. But since the 2016 election, even the most ardent centrists are now beginning to admit that we're not just sorted that there really is a deep division. Now, divisions in politics have always been part of American society, American government. Indeed, uh, just like our legal system, where adversarial uh, uh, attorneys can argue things out to get to the truth. I mean, a certain amount of political division is good. 
And we, we can never hope to come to some um, overall unity. There'll always be divisions between those who um, are most focused on correcting what's wrong and people are more focused on preserving what's right. So it's almost like the polarity is, is, a, is a natural condition of human political organization. But polarities can either be uh, generative of higher truth, they can either lead to a, to a, a more synthetic understanding that, that goes to a higher place, or polarities can become stuck. The binding element in any political division or any political polarity is a common cause, uh, as, as Suzanne mentioned in her talk this morning. But the common cause that, that once bound America for the good of the country, you know, for the American people, for us together as Americans, much of that common cause has been lost. And as a result, not so much of a decay, I mean, there's certainly been some regression in our political uh, situation, but there's also been a, a more optimistic way of seeing it without denying the problem, is that as a result of cultural development, as I'll explain, we've come to the point where we no longer agree about what constitutes progress. Right. For some, progress remains um, you know, economic growth and uh, upward mobility economically. Right? For other people, progress is about environmental sustainability and about um, becoming a more uh, environmentally conscious society. That would be progress. For other groups in America, progress is defined as a sort of a restoration of a past consensus or a, a past greatness. So as a result of, of the differentiation of our culture, we, we can no longer agree about progress, and this makes it very difficult to agree about what the common good is. Now, many commentators, uh, especially mainstream commentators, you know, I try to read the, the major papers every day and, and find out what the, uh, both the, the pundit sphere <laughs> is, is saying or arguing about. And, since the 2016 election, many of our brightest mainstream commentators have become uh, somewhat stunned by the situation. In other words, they're admitting now, many of them, that it is a cultural problem. But for many mainstream commentators, uh, culture is kind of a black box. You know, the, the, the idea that, um, that we could actually change or evolve it or, or foster its maturation is um, an idea that isn't um, very well developed or understood within mainstream discourse. But defining cultural maturity and working on techniques that can gently persuade people to adopt a wider view, a, a greater scope of values, is, uh, is really the work of the Institute for Cultural Evolution, which I'm you know, here sh to share. You know, it's important to say that bipartisan compromise is certainly good when you can get it. But the idea that we're going to just glue the pieces back together again, right? that this differentiation could just be um, brought together by exhorting people to be more unified, or by just try to remind people uh, or scold them into thinking of the greater good. I mean, this was the theory that, that polarization was a matter of politicians behaving badly, and that they needed a compromise for the greater good. But as I argue at length in a recent paper, no matter how much I admire efforts to create a, a, a vital center in American politics, I think it's, it's uh, time to admit, at least for now, that centrism is a failed strategy. And I'll help explain why that is, but why that doesn't mean that uh, you know, there's no hope for reaching um, a tentative consensus again. So when we, when we want to look more deeply into culture, when we want to understand culture in a way that, that makes the idea of helping culture mature become possible, the, um, the, 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 it's important to see that culture can't be simply modeled with a single model or a single description, a, a, a linear uh, version of advance or a, a simple stage theory. Culture is a very complex, emergent phenomenon. So to understand it more deeply and get at its roots more thoroughly, um, it's important to look at it from a variety of different angles, different slices of the larger cultural pie. And um, tomorrow in my workshop, I'll be looking at a variety of these angles and talking about some of the more hands-on techniques for bringing about cultural maturity, understanding values more, more deeply. 
But among the various viewpoints or, or angles on culture that sheds the most light on our current problem, um, again, partial but, but powerful, is this idea of, of world views. So a world view is arguably the basic unit of culture, right? If we ask what the modern world is, you know, what, what is modernity, you know, the dominant culture of America? I mean, it's many things, and it can't be reduced to a list or a simple definition, but more than anything else, I think modernity is a worldview, right? The lack of this worldview, the lack of the value set that enacts modernity um, keeps many um, developing countries from reaching the, the prosperity that modernity can bring because it's, it's the worldview that is the, the underlying foundation of the, of the material prosperity. But, you know, I show this slide here with the eye. It's kind of cliche. I, I think this slide illustrates the worldview a little bit more, right? So, like, this is the conscious part up here. But this is the sort of the intersubjective cultural part. You know, in some ways, our worldviews think our thoughts for us. You know, the worldviews, as I'm using this defined term, they're, they're intergenerational agreements about what's valuable. They provide identity. They, they, they give a viewpoint. They define what's good and true and beautiful uh, for a given set of people in a given time in history. And like I said, modernity is the dominant worldview of the United States, but there's, there's more than one worldview, right? Most people are familiar with this uh, red state, blue state map. And uh, it, uh, it's, it's looking pretty red if you look at it by uh, counties. But if we remember that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote and we skew the map um, to, to account for population, uh, it, 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 you can see that it is more evenly divided according to this slice of, of looking at it. Um, and sorry, but Pennsylvania's still red. <laughs> um, and so going deeper beyond this red state and blue state, we begin to understand the, the stratigraphy of the political landscape, if you will, right? So what's most visible to the media, of course, is the, the elected officials and what's going on among our, our leaders and, and, uh, and politicians. And then, of course, these politicians are, are represented by political parties, which is sort of the next strata. But for most people, politics is more about issues and interests, right? Where, where most of the, whoops, most of the political, um, most, of, most political energy is, and most political money is raised for the issues and interests themselves, uh, which are often irreconcilable among parties, right? I mean, you know, your interest is something that um, you're ready, some people are ready to, to die for, because those interests are associated directly with identity, right? Worldviews provide identity. And so when someone threatens your worldview, it, it, it feels like a personal threat. And so when we look down here at the level of bedrock values, if you will, the, that which is sometimes subconscious, right? We don't, we're not always aware of what our worldviews are or how, how these deeper values that have been um, moving through history, uh, how they affect our thinking and, and define what we see as our interests. But, the, but it's at this level of values that culture resides, and it's at this level where um, I think the work of overcoming and healing our divisions needs to be focused. So modernity, let's call it the modernist worldview, right? It's, it, it began um, during the Enlightenment, right? And, and, and it, it, this, this way of seeing, in a sense, helped bring about the United States. The founding documents of the United States are in some ways a manifesto of modernist values. But modernity, not only in the United States, but in other countries and other developed countries as well, is typically divided um, sort of down the middle, right? Yeah, I mean, using these New York Times colors, pardon me, I'm using these New York Times colors to illustrate how within the agreement, the mainstream agreement of, of, uh, of America, um, about half of the people naturally fall um, in, on the Republican side and, and another half naturally fall on the, on the Democratic side. And even though there's a right and a left wing of, of modernity, uh, many often complain that there's very little difference between modernist politicians, right? So th that is, th they share the same values even though they may be Democrats or Republicans. But we also know that there's more than one major worldview in the United States. Um, 
Modernity can't be defined. You know, if I were to make a list or try to, to frame it in an in a, um, academically satisfying way, it would be cliche or stereotyped, right? This is the dominant culture, so there's no list of values or no simple definition that can capture it. But I can give you some examples, right? So according to this rubric of the good, the true, and the beautiful, for modernity, good, the good is, like I said, progress, upward mobility, prosperity, individual liberty, higher education, international cooperation, Almost all modernists share these values, right? Science, reason, objectivity, right? Uh, fashion and modern art forms. Again, it's about 50% according to um, some of the s social science, like the World Values Survey. Um, we have about 50% of the United States who make meaning or identify themselves according to this set of values. You know, Bill Clinton was a modernist. But so is Jeb Bush, so is Rand Paul. The, the, sort of the, the mainstream establishment um, leaders of the United States pretty much ascribe to this worldview. But as is also fairly well established and well understood in American culture, we still have a, a large po portion of the population who are, have more traditional beliefs. For them, um, you know, they make meaning according to, uh, they may use modernist technology, they may uh, even vote for modernist candidates, but the, the rise of, of uh, socially conservative traditional politics has made a big impact on the American um, political scene, especially beginning with the, the Reagan administration. Just again, this is not a definition, but just some examples just to remind you of what you already know, you can already see, this is pretty obvious, and that is um, you know, traditionalism, the traditional worldview consists of, of a variety of religions, but, but there's a remarkable uh, sort of continuity or solidarity among the different, most of the different religions, um, traditional uh, religions in the United States. So of course the golden rule, God's will, family, patriotism, these are the goods as defined by the traditional worldview. The truth is more really defined by, by scripture than by science, right? So if science contradicts scripture, then for traditionalists, scripture is going to uh, trump science. And that's because it's, it's built into their identity, right? So traditional uh, politicians include um, Ted Cruz or Mike Huckabee. Again, this is a, a, a highly visible worldview that can be distinguished from the mainstream worldview of modernity. But even though, for example, this has been around, people have known about this. Some of you may have read Thomas Friedman's book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree. Right, which describes these two cultures, not just in America, but worldwide, and how they are very different. And indeed, modernity originally um, broke out of traditionalism during the Enlightenment, right? overthrowing the king, uh, bringing in democracy, uh, achieving in, in some ways the great enrichment. Right? We went from living, most people living on $3 a day to what economists say is now about $150 a day. It's like a 5,000% increase. And so in some ways, modernity um, has been the greatest thing that's happened to human civilization since the domestication of agriculture. Right? I mean, we, we sort of take it for granted now and, and are focused on overcoming the problems created by modernity, which I'll get to here in a second. But this, this, this dialectic, this thesis and antithesis, where, where the modern world pushed off against the traditional world, um, that's sort of... that division has been carried through in history, but since um, really for throughout most of the 20th century, but especially after World War II, there was kind of a cultural truce between the traditional worldview and the modernist worldview, right? The modernist worldview was in power, but the traditional worldview was sort of allowed to provide most of the morality, most of the values were still sort of anchored in traditionalism. And this, this cultural truce between traditionalism and modernity uh, characterized um, this post-war period of, of uh, great consensus. It's known by political scientists as the liberal consensus, right, from 1945 until about 1968. And we got a lot of things done, right? The civil rights legislation, the, you know, the government was relatively functional, even though it was, of course, still divided between um, the left and the right. But beginning around uh, 1968, 
a third major culture has sort of emerged and appeared, pushing off against modernity, defining itself in opposition to modernity, right? So now we have th three major cultures. Now, why did that go off? Can I have some technical assistance? Okay, scary. <laughs> um, so three major cultures in the United States. And again, they're blended together. You know, these are, these are not hard divisions. In some ways, you could say that these are, these are types of consciousness within people more than it is types of people themselves. Some people exemplify these specific cultural worldviews uh, completely. You know, they're sort of stereotypical representatives, whereas others defy categorization according to worldview. But for many mainstream commentators in America, they can only see the, the, the sort of the parts of postmodernism, especially the most, um, the most uh, unappealing parts. Now, let me say the word postmodern is itself a battleground of meaning, right? For many, it stands for uh, critical theory, right? Deconstructive academia, which is a sort of a subset of the postmodern worldview. For others, it, it stands for an art movement, right? But, at the Institute for Cultural Evolution, we use the term progressive postmodern as a, uh, for lack of, you know, a, a, a better agreed upon set of terms, for this worldview that has emerged beyond modernity, right? In the World Values Survey, uh, Ronald Engelhardt, the founder of this robust academic multi-decade research project, he refers to them as, as post-material values. But however you define them, beginning in the 60s, there has been this kind of emergence of uh, what's no longer really a counterculture. It's sort of a, a counter-establishment, if you will. And um, this, uh, this can be seen in many elements of American society. Um, for progressive postmodern uh, people who ascribe to this worldview, the good, like I said, is environmental sustainability, multiculturalism, social justice, economic equality. These are all very important values, which I've really shared myself since I was, uh, you know, became a awakened to political consciousness. The true is, truth is not so much ob hardly objective as it is in modernity. It's more subjective, more constructed. Um, you could even make fun of it and say, you know, truth within postmodernism is what is, whatever truth what is ever, ever true for you, which in some ways has contributed, at least, to some of the uh, post-truth age that we find ourselves in. Again, I don't want to lay the blame with postmodernism, but it's important to see these cultural currents. It's no longer a counterculture, like I said. It's not just the hippie movement. It, it sort of became adopted by a major portion of the American society, especially um, elite academia, um, the entertainment industry, you know, the music industry. You see postmodern culture in many places, and, and um, figures, who you might identify with it, for example, Bernie Sanders is certainly an, an authentic postmodernist, um, but, but most postmodern leaders are not within establishment institutions like the Senate. Um, we could point to uh, familiar names like Naomi Klein, the environmental anti-corporate activist, or Deepak Chopra, right, the uh, alternative spirituality uh, teacher. Um, so Traditionalism, modernism, and postmodernism are really the three major cultures of America as we find ourselves at this moment. And it's because of this differentiation, you know, beginning with the Enlightenment, modernity differentiated itself from tra the traditional worldview, and then in the last 50 years, this sort of postmodern worldview, this understanding postmodernism is very important for overcoming the cultural divisions that plague our country. Because postmodernism is, is, in a sense, seizing the opportunity for cultural evolution in, in the area created by modernity's shortcomings. Right? Modernism, for all its incredible technology and wealth and prosperity and globalization, it's not the end of history. Right? And no matter how much cultural evolution it, is, it has brought about, it's also created problems, but, you know, it threatens humanity in ways that no other worldview has before or since. Um, you know, the, in, not only nuclear proliferation, um, it, but you know, environmental degradation, uh, a race to the bottom globally, right? There are, there are many goods, but there are also many, many uh, challenges and, and uh, uh, negatives that have come from the globalizing rise of modernity. 
And, and postmodernism as a, as a worldview sort of formed, I mean, it, you could trace it all the way back to the Enlightenment itself with uh, uh, contrary thinkers like Rousseau, right? Or, or uh, you know, the, the transcendentalists like uh, Emerson and Thoreau. You know, many, they were sort of proto-postmodernists in a sense. They were offended by modernity and its environmental degradation. But, but the sort of the revolt of the artists and intellectuals within modernism um, was, was remained within modernist culture uh, throughout the 20th century until the dramatic events of the 60s, right, with 1968 sort of as a, a, a kind of a, um, a pivotal year. Um, and it was beginning in that year that, that the, um, the larger culture began to, uh, at least a portion of them, 20% of the larger culture, began to wake up to the fact that um, modernity um, couldn't be all there was. But opportunities for, for making things better, in a sense, were defined by what was wrong. And so, in a sense, if, if, if we see modernity as a thesis, we can see how postmodern culture has arisen as a kind of antithesis to, to modernism. It defines itself, in a sense, its values are defined by what's wrong with modernity. You know, the, the care for the environment, is in, that value is awakened by the destruction of the environment, right? Hope for equality, that is sort of, is created by the gross inequality that, that the um, economic prosperity brought by modernity brings. So it's important to see how, how postmodernism is, is, is animated by what's wrong. But of course, the antithesis uh, of, of, of something is, is, is not unstable. It doesn't really provide a, a, an alternative. It just focuses on what's wrong and tearing down the, you know, the, the problems of the existing system. And that's an important step, but that's kind of where we are. We, th that is, the cultural truce between traditionalism and modernism was broken by, at, at, when postmodernism merged as a culture and a worldview of its own, you know, with its own market and its own political power, or at least relatively. And so this, in a sense, disrupted, because now that there's there, the, the traditionalism and postmodernism are each each have sort of robust sets of morality that are competing for the heart and soul of, of, of modernity, you know, at this time in history, and it's a sort of a tug of war. Um, so if we, if we take these worldviews, worldview uh, conception, and we map it onto the left-right <laughs> spectrum, right, instead of a timeline um, from uh, from from right to left, we get this, or le left to right, we get this uh, configuration. And, and David Brooks recently had a column about uh, the four cultures of America. He didn't describe them exactly in these terms, but, but the, the, the four cultures matched pretty well, right? So, you know, within the mainstream, we have fiscally conservative modernists and, and libertarians, right? These are the sort of establishment Republicans. We have liberal modernists, like Hillary Clinton for the most part. And, and then we have the progressive postmoderns who, who uh, you know, the, 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 um, the polarity, if you will, that exists between these two different cultural forms, even both on the left, uh, is, is uh, having a lot of influence on the election right now. So uh, this sort of shows how when we, when we spread out the four cultures, or you know, the three worldviews that form four cultures across the spectrum of left and right, we can see that the, 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 the polarity, the hyperpartisan polarity, of course it exists across left and right in general, but it also exists, um, you know, so, so we have, damn. It's this, so sorry. I've got my little pointer here. It's the first time I used it. So I'm, Again, this is a subject I'll, I'll talk about in my workshop more thoroughly tomorrow, this idea of, of polarities, how a polarity can be good and bad, but it can also be good and good, right? Like values and things that create value often appear in interdependent sets that are both, um, that offer both challenge and support, you know, sort of like competition and cooperation, or, or uh, freedom and order, or liberty and equality, mercy and justice. It's almost as if these values naturally pair up in a way that they, their, their tension kind of trues, has a tendency when they function appropriately, they can true each other up, two sides. But polarities can be either generative of greater value or they could become stuck, right? So this is where we are now. We're sort of stuck 
with this overarching polarity, which is sort of a, uh, a larger manifestation of this, but it's sort of across the society. But interestingly, with the emergence of postmodernism, this creates a new polarity on the left, which then exasper ex push it, pulls these apart, or the cultural truce is broken, like I said. So this is just illustrating that same idea. Um, here is it, this one looks pretty messy, but you can kind of see, you know, how how it translates back and forth. So understanding that 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 each one of these worldviews has very important values that it's brought to our society and negatives that go with them. So if we take these four cultures, as I've been describing them, you know, the socially conservative traditionalists, fiscally conservative modernists, liberal modernists, and progressive postmodernists, and we dig down into the values of each one of these major cultures, we begin to get a chart that looks like this. Now, first, don't try to read it. <laughs> um, I put it up here to show that this is a, a, a practice, if you will, that, that unpacking the values and understanding the values better leads to the synthesis beyond the antithesis of postmodernism. It begins to show how we can um, begin to stake out a political position um, that can hopefully be attractive and can be a, a position that stands outside any one of these cultures um, and begins to appreciate how they each have a contribution to make within a larger cultural ecosystem. But it's not simply value relativism. I'm not just saying, oh, well, we just want the best of all and they're all good. It's, it's more nuanced and, and um, complicated than that. So I've given these, these uh, major cultures, um, right, we, the social conservatives, fiscal conservatives, liberals, and progressives, I've given them nicknames so we can begin to appreciate what these values are. So we have, here we have heritage values, right? Um, the patriotic pride in America, um, championing of our, of our religious heritage, um, encouraging assimilation, right? These are, these are some of the, 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 the heritage values that social conservatives, and indeed all of us, to some extent, um, usually hold to some degree, right? Here we have the, the, the sovereign right of the individual, right? And, and then the spontaneous order uh, of free markets, right? Rather than uh, being, you know, the economic organization being imposed from the top, these are very important values, uh, and, and they actually have a morality to them. Right? Part of the, the, the morality of modernity involves this, this creating this sovereign space for the freedom and liberty of the individual. And, and the, 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 the necessary achievement of that sovereignty and, and individual liberty, it's often lost on both uh, uh, traditionals and progressives um, who are more concerned about the group than the individual. But, but there is a huge morality here, which I write about um, in, in the articles and op-eds on the Institute for website. Here I'm, I'm, I'm calling these liberty values, heritage values, fairness values, right? Champion, champion the working and middle classes against big business, protect the rights and interests of minorities and women. These have always been, in a sense, democratic values. But progressive values go further, right? Protect the environment above all else, right? Even if it causes economic damage, right? Promote strong affirmative action. You know, this is not good enough over here. We want to go further. We want to, we want to promote feminism and equality, localism and natural lifestyle. And we want to expose the abuses of modernity and atone for the sins that have come about as a result of the rise of the developed world. So I put these up here, even though it's not really appropriate for a slide in a talk, but just to sort of illustrate this practice that, that Every one of these sets of values has harsh negatives that go with them. Right? They're woven together with the positives. Right? So woven together with these positive heritage values is some, you know, not all, certainly not all traditionalists are racists, sexists, or, uh, or, or author overly authoritarian. But those, val those, those pathologies, if you will, are in a sense rooted here. Right? Here, uh, the libertarians and, and fiscal conservatives, they can be selfish, elitist, and have this sort of doctrinaire view that the government must be reduced and shrunk at all costs. Right? Fairness values, very important, but they, they can create bloated bureaucracies and they can be captured by special interests. Right? And all can be captured by special interests. Right? All can be selfish. All can, can be authoritarian. 
again, we don't want to say that these values only reside in these particular categories, but we can begin to see that, that from within any one, whatever your worldview is or whatever culture you find yourself identifying with, when you look at the other forms of American culture, it's typically these negatives that are most visible. You know, you, you think about social conservatives, for example, I know many progressives do, and they see, they see them as simply racist or, or homophobic. And indeed, you know, th that, that's, that's a pathology that we want to overcome, but the point of, of getting to a synthesis, it involves teasing apart the dignities from the disasters. Right, being able to recognize that, that because these, every one of these cultural value spheres has arisen to solve a specific set of problems. And those problems are still very much with us, right? The great stretching out of the culture can't be simply glued back together because the problems that traditionalism originally arose to take care of, you know, the warlords, crime, disorder, uh, egocentrism, right? The lack of respect for, for rightful authority, those problems are still with us. Right? The problems of breaking out of authoritarianism, that, that's still a problem that we need to work on. So every one of these values has got important work to do that's ongoing. Right? But again, they're in conflict with each other, and so it's, it's, it's very difficult from within any one of these worldviews to see the others um, not for their downsides, and, and that involves a, a practice, again, which I'll talk about tomorrow in my workshop, if you'll allow me to keep referring to that. But, but it's, it's it, the, the, the practice of values integration, which I'll talk about and give some examples here in a moment, but it's fine-grained, and it takes, it takes working with these values, understanding them a little bit more, and, uh, and being able to appreciate, being able to see the culture, right? The culture exists at the level of, uh, of, of the bedrock values, right? This is where the culture is. And down here, in these, in these values categories, um, are a lot of uh, historical scaffolding, if you will, right? These, um, these worldviews are, are, in a sense, each one is arising to, to, to the, the values are animated by problematic life conditions. And because the, each, each worldview in this sort of course of historical development is, is working to get away from the pathologies that it encounters at, at its time in history, um, in a sense, the negatives are, are inevitable, right? So, it's a little bit this course of historical development driven by problematic conditions. Um, you know, Hegel recognized it 200 years ago. It, it, it's definitely a process, a, a dialectical process of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. It's a little bit like a sailboat tacking against the wind, right? The sailboat can't sail directly into the wind. And, and just like culture can, can develop, what's wrong can be solved by reference to what's, what's right is always in reference to what's wrong, right? Values are animated by problems. So the sailboat's kind of tacking, it's like more like a, maybe a, a river meandering in a floodplain. You can only go so far getting away from one set of problems before you create a set of problems that requires the next tack or the next worldview to solve, right? This was a famous quote by Einstein. This is some problems can't be solved at the same level that created them. So, Values integration, right? What does that look like? What does that mean? Again, it's 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 similar to centrism, but it's different, right? It's, it's we're, John Avalon, editor of the Daily Beast, you know who I've met. He's a ardent centrist, one of the more prominent centrist voices in America, and he talks about how we need to sort of um, uh, cut off the wing nuts. Right? We need to come together, we need to, the extremists are what, what are pulling us apart, and we need to, to sort of silence those voices or ignore those voices and, and, and come together you know, for the greater good in the middle. But what Avalon thinks of as wingnuts, I sometimes can recognize as uh, sort of the, the visionaries who are leading us to a higher level of civilization. So it's not just a matter of cutting off the ends or, or, or trying to homogenize the culture back into some uh, forced consensus. We can move from this antithesis, this challenge of postmodernism, to a more synthetic understanding that can appreciate how all of these worldviews and all these values, in a sense, are um, part of this larger cultural ecosystem. And so, again, the, with the stratigraphy, when it comes to interests at this level, 
it's often a win-lose proposition. Right? Some interests are just irreconcilable. Right? There's, there's bound to be a battle, and it's a power struggle to see whose, whose interests are going to prevail. But at the level of values, integration becomes more possible. So the prime example of, of, a, of a successful political issue, which is moving, move forward through values integration, uh, is gay marriage. Right? So gay marriage used to be a, a bitterly contested culture war issue, and in, in some ways it still is. But the issue of gay marriage, it, it integrates values from all of the major categories which I've talked about. So for example, it, 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 postmodern caring values are certainly forwarded by the right for gay people to marriage, to marry, right? The fairness values are there, certainly liberty values, but crucially, Gay marriage forwards traditional family values. Maybe not traditional, but those who object to gay marriage on grounds of decadence, for example, have a hard time objecting to a basic right to make a family commitment. And because even though the interests of social conservative traditionalists aren't represented by gay marriage, they see it as against their interests, their values are integrated nonetheless. Another example uh, would be um, the legalization of marijuana. Uh, that, again, in a very polarized political situation where hardly any initiatives are getting traction or moving forward, this one, at least at, this, at the level of many states, has achieved remarkable success, again, being a, a bitter culture war issue. But again, there's, there's not only the integration of, of, uh, of caring values, postmodern values, it's indeed, you know, legal pot is and it's a sort of postmodern issue, but you also have fairness values that, that so many people have been incarcerated by the war on drugs that it's, it, it's, a, it, it's seen as a kind of a racist uh, outcome. Um, and, and of course, libertarian values are there because the, the, at least the, the liberty values of, of, of having people to have uh, sovereign rights, their freedom if they want to smoke pot, those are there. But the, the, the heritage value or the, the socially conservative value that, that is sort of integrated into the, the campaign for legal pot is federalism, right? That issues such as prohibition should be able to be decided at a local level, right? The federal government shouldn't be deciding whether, uh, you know, people in Colorado, for example, where I live, um, can take marijuana. So that's, in a sense, because that, that the, the, the value itself is integrated, it, in, a, in a sense, can overcome the opposition. It can sort of melt, um, melt the, the opposing interests because the values are, are brought forward nonetheless. Um, a couple of issues that are, that are um, the opposite, for example, I mentioned climate change at the beginning. Um, at least one reason why the amelioration of climate change is not a higher priority for uh, the American electorate at this time in history uh, is that there is this lack of integration of liberty values and heritage values. The, 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 um, you know, the doomsaying and the scolding and, and the, um, you know, the, the way in which the environmental movement is adamant. I'm an environmentalist and I'm freaked out by global warming myself. But I really want to see it. I don't, I don't want to just have moral preening about it. I want to see it actually get traction in, in the American political sy system. And in order to do that, there's got to be, I would argue, according to this method of values integration, a better integration of, of the prosperity values of modernity, of, of recognizing that not only is the environment sacred, but in some ways the civilizational achievements of modernity are also sacred. And um, uh, you know there, there, are, there are values on the right, again, I'm on the left, but there's values on the right that if they were better integrated into the program to try to ameliorate climate change, um, despite many on the right seeing it as being as against their interests, I think we'd find um, that we would gain political traction. Immigration is another issue, where if there was greater values integration, if, if those who were advocating for um, more humane and fair immigration policies in the United States were able into themselves, without, it's not a matter of horse trading or, or sort of issue coalition building. What I'm suggesting in this practice of values integration is that the advocates for the, for the individual um, issue they really need to own the values themselves. In other words, values integration is a practice that we do within ourselves before we go out in the political world and try to negotiate with any, any of our opponents. It's something we realize that, that our culture is, in a sense, it, it's, it's an ecosystem where the earlier achievements, these very important achievements of the traditional culture, are, are foundational 
for the success of modernity and how this new layer of care of postmodernism needn't be completely in antithesis. It doesn't necessarily need to reject modernism or, or be anti-patriotic. There's ways in which we can add this new layer of care while preserving the accomplishments of the civilization um, has achieved you know, in the last 500 years. So there's a lot more to this cultural perspective, and I hope we can talk about it. I really wanted to just put these worldviews and, and this method of values integration on the table so that um, we can talk about them um, and uh, explore them a little bit more. So um, that's my presentation. <laughs> So, um, so, can we, will someone, someone ask a question? Yes, go ahead. How do we get through to present to is emotionally and intellectually inept? How do we get through? Trump. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> well, okay, so, so in, in this, um, can uh, you the question, please? Yes, sure, I would. Um, Trump is, uh, is President Trump, our leader, is uh, not only, you say, intellectually um, dense, but emotionally uh, inept. And how do we get through to Trump? OK, well, um, let, me, let me go back to this. And you know, I want to, part of this values integration also involves, I mean, it's hard for me to respect President Trump myself, but I respect my fellow countrymen, right? and there's a sort of folk wisdom of the, of, of the people that, if I look beyond the, the political horror show and, and look at the, the, um, the actual uh, uh, electorate and say, what, what caused my fellow countrymen to send um, Donald Trump to the highest office in the land, even though he himself might be here, kind of pretty traditional, <laughs> um, I mean, that's a real stage. I mean, the stage is all the way go back to the archaic, the tribal, you know, the warrior culture, and, and that involves the traditional. So, so Trump's definitely in this kind of pre-traditional warrior mentality. But it's important to say, you know, while he's certainly here as well, it's important to see how uh, postmodern culture has a tendency to dissolve traditional culture. You know, green dissolves yellow in this in this scheme, and. In many ways, the, the, even though social conservatism is still strong, right? even though I think the evangelical movement, for example, is growing, there's ways in which the traditional moral foundations of, of mainstream America have been eroded by the, the erosion of their social norms and their mores and their values. And so many traditionalists not only have lost um, heart, you, know, you see this in the decay of, of, of rural American culture or, or uh, uh, blue collar American culture as documented by a variety of books. Um, Charles Murray's Coming Apart um, documents the, the demoralization of the traditional segment of the society. Um, but you can also see in the opioid epidemic and other signs of cultural decay. I mean, this this uh, once proud uh, uh, source of morality for America has come under threat by an alternative and competing source of morality. And so these people hired protection. You know, Donald Trump is like the bouncer that they sent in, right? You don't necessarily want to look too closely at the arrest record when you're hiring protection. And so I, I think it's, I mean, again, I, I, you know, I make fun of it, but, but the situation is, is that this culture does need to be preserved because this ultimately collapses into a pre-traditional sort of mafioso corrupt culture if it doesn't have some level of fair play, respect for authority, honesty, decency. These are values which reside here. Even when this form of culture has been in some ways transcended, if we don't carry forward the civilizational achievements of this level of culture, then the rest of the culture, the rest of our progress is unsustainable. So having a certain sympathy for the cultural distress that many people uh, in the traditional world, and, and you know, again, there's still, still a lot of overlap here between these uh, cultures on the right, Understanding how um, they've been uh, compelled to send the tough guy in to battle with uh, the cultural ascendancy of the postmodern worldview for good and bad. So that's so. How do we get through to him? I say um, the, the focus ought to be on getting through to our our, our countrymen, 
you know, our, our fellow Americans who reside here by, in a sense, integrating their values, by, by acknowledging that there are very important achievements of traditional society that we depend on that we're using right now, even in our most um, you know, progressive cultural enclaves. It's the sort of the foundation of, uh, of upward mobility and achievement, you know, I mean, not just the economic, but scientific achievement and you know, achievement in the arts and any of the institutions of our society, education is the foundation. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't have a, a, you know, an explanation. I would say that the, um, the cultural decay that we're experiencing as, as these different cultures pull apart, right, the animosity that exists between the different forms of society. It's coarsened our culture uh, in, in ways that are certainly lamentable. Um, but every one of these worldviews emerged because of very challenging life conditions, right? The life conditions, in a sense, are what call forth and animate the higher level of values, right? So we find ourselves in this situation, not just within the Trump administration, but you know, in, in, a, in a divided society. But um, that is a powerfully uh, a stimulative life condition, which I believe will lead to further cultural evolution. And that further cultural evolution will become, uh, will come in the form of, uh, if you pardon the term, post-postmodern culture, right? right? Uh, uh, it's sort of an integral culture that integrates these values that, if it weren't for the achievements of postmodernism, if it didn't, you know, the care for the environment, social justice, multiculturalism, alternative, you know, the breaking out of, of the straitjacket of scientism, right? These are major achievements of, of this countercultural postmodern worldview. And without those achievements, we wouldn't, without the antithesis, as harsh and disrespectful as it can be, without that antithesis, we wouldn't be able to, to lead to a, a, a higher level of synthesis where we can, we can reclaim what's been lost, right? So, um, uh, the way evolution works at every level, cosmological, biological, and cultural, is first there's differentiation, but that leads to a higher level of integration. And so this is the problematic life condition, but this is why I remain hopeful that further cultural evolution can maybe not you know, unite us into one culture like it existed in the post-war consensus, but certainly a more respectful culture where um, we can not only respect other people's values, but actually own them to a degree ourselves. How to reconcile the right to have free, uh, free speech mm -hmm. with telling outright lies? Now, politicians have always lied, but it's tended to be more subtle. Right. Now there's untruths, clear untruths. Right. How do you reconcile free speech and lies? Right, right. Well, uh, 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 yeah, thank you for that question. How do we reconcile free speech and, and the post-truth flying culture that we seem to find ourselves in? Um, I think part of the answer is that, um, is that there, there are some things that can't be legislated. Like, we certainly legislate free speech, right? That was one of the, uh, the major values of modernity you know, enshrined in the Constitution, right? But when it comes to telling the truth, that's something that the government or the laws can't necessarily um, inculcate. I mean, we can't sort of say you must tell the truth. I mean, you certainly can when you're under oath in a courtroom, right? But in a cultural context, um, it's, it's, there's some things that law isn't, isn't uh, adequate to try to regulate. It's got to be regulated by cultural norms, right? So we have, we, we, used, to, we used to have honesty, decency, and respect for authority that caused people to, you know, blanch when they lied or, or you know, in other words, the Machiavellian actors who were willing to lie on price, the social norms that prevailed during the consensus helped to, um, uh, helped to overcome those, right? So you think of J Joseph McCarthy, right, in that famous cathartic moment when you know, somebody questioned, sir, how do you know decency, you know? And that was sort of the end of McCarthyism in a way because the social norms, everybody could feel that social norm inside themselves to be honest and to be decent. 
Um, and, and it was more powerful than any law could be in terms of regulating the culture and exposing you know, those who were harming it. So we, these norms, these social norms have been severely questioned and disrupted, I think, for, and they should have been. You know, that was sort of part of it, right? The, there's a lot of traditional values that are no longer serviceable for our you know, culture that we have now. And so the liberation from the oppressive nature of those, which I listed in those values charts, was again a major accomplishment over here. And you know, there have been some ways that, that this postmodern culture, which has, had, has a strong sense of morality, has tried to inculcate um, social norms in a sense that it replace a lot of this going on at the sort of unconscious level of culture. They don't have a model of culture like this. But nevertheless, there's, there's this attempt to, to bring about new social norms, and we see excesses, like in excess of political correctness, right, on some college campuses, right? But the, the underlying norms that the excess of political correctness would attempt to inculcate, those are good norms. Those are social norms that we need, right? We need multiculturalism, right? But again, one of the ways we can restore uh, respect for decency and honesty and, and, and get some of these alternative social norms to, be, to carry forward some of the social norms that once constrained our society, you know, that's the job of synthesis. And so, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a, an immediate, how do we get people to stop telling lies? <laughs> but, but I guess, you know, the, the sort of regaining our collective sense of what we are willing to tolerate as a culture, establishing a social norm that can encompass the whole in ways that used to prevail is, is one of the answers. A couple more questions, yes. In the in the process of values integration, how do you practically speak to the liberal versus conservative in more than what do you give versus what do you get? Like does it still boil down to that as a process? And are we simply just expanding, growing with the diversity of the culture, shrinking the world, bringing the two extremes back to a new circle, new modern? That's just a great question. Um, so I can try to get it at it from one angle and, and follow up if I'm not answering what you're, what you're getting at. Another way of thinking about these worldviews is as forms of consciousness. Right? In, in, in my book, Integral Consciousness, I talk about this, this idea of a post-postmodern post, post worldview. Um, well, anyway, in there. Um, is, is that the consciousness already includes, so these values are sort of made up, these, these, these forms of culture are made up of values. Values are the substance, and value agreements are what cohere in so organizing systems which you recognize as cultural structures, intersubjective, intergenerational cultural structures. And so the, the, the thinking that goes with every one of these, these forms of culture is a form of consciousness itself. And so, Integral consciousness, which is in a sense post postmodern, as I said, if you're part of the term, um, in a sense tries to integrate every one of these values. We try to already have these values. So if we're trying to negotiate with an opponent in a political situation, or trying to convince someone to, um, uh, to adopt our point of view or vote the way we want them to vote, part of it might be persuading them, and, and your ability to persuade someone is. is, is uh, largely determined by the empathy and the sympathy and, and the, the fellow feeling that you have with that person. And if the values of that person are foreign or inexplicable, or you only can see those values, or your view of those values is tainted by the negatives and pathologies that are woven together with them, like I explained, then that lack of emotional connection is not good either. And that's in a face-to-face situation. In a more national situation, I think certainly, you know, in terms of rhetorical strategies, uh, that, that, that's a good one to have. But, but even before we're trying to persuade someone in a direct argument or in, in discussion, there's, there's a ways in which the way we frame the issue, the issue that we, we want to champion or we want to vote for, or the pressure that we put on our representatives to, to go for an issue, that, that the issue itself is already defined in a way that it integrates those values. Right? So again, from, from integral consciousness, your, your political desiderata um, it involves programs and, and solutions that have done their best to integrate all of every one of these values. Sometimes it's edited and obvious, and sometimes it's really tough. You know, I'm not saying this is a panacea for all our problems, 
but it's at least an approach to begin to think synthetically about how we can overcome our you know, deeply divided culture. Thinking about Germany, you know, you have a Germany, since well, over the last 50 years, well, now, hopefully, it has turned out to be a force for integration in Europe to a limited extent. And that somehow the Germans have grown out of the divisions that, that emerged after World War II in order to come together and realize that they must. Now, is that is that a cultural, overwhelming cultural Unity that is driving that, or is that the, the, the economic um, forcefulness of, of German? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Germany is, 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 a, is a great, but also very tough example because it's complicated and unrepresentative. Because in some ways, you know, they achieved some of the highest levels of civilization, they had some of the greatest geniuses of humanity, right. but they've also committed humanity's greatest crime. Right. But in some ways, the reason that, that Germany is not as polarized is that they have this common good, which is, in a sense, the collective guilt. Yeah. Right? There's this heavy collective guilt in Germany about the Holocaust and about you know, the, the Nazi period. And that sense of being German is, 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 um, is held together, in a way, by this kind of complex and troubled German identity. Right? So also, um, the United States is a country of immigrants, so we have a much larger population of People who have a traditional or, or if you're part of the term pre-modern worldview, um, you know, 30 percent of the U.S. are in this traditional worldview. In Germany, it's, it's they're almost all modernists, right? Postmodernism is not as well developed as it is in the United States, at least not the cultural version of it. You know, that, that as you see it, there are certainly German postmodernists. They've been around since the 60s, but it hasn't pulled the country apart. It's still, you know, there, there's still a large center of gravity in modernity, and that's reinforced by this sense of, of German identity and their, their historical pressure to atone for the sins of the 20th century that's going to be you know, pulling them together and creating their unity um, you know, throughout the century until they're able to you know, do something good for the world that makes up for the Holocaust. And one more question? Um, you uh, told us about the values from each of the uh, four categories which you combine to change our ideas about gay marriage. Um, which of the values from the, the traditionalists uh, can be integrated to help us uh, extend our uh, ecological sustainability? Sure. Well, this is something that you've seen. I've seen, for example, within the environmental movement. Um, for a while, there was a, 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 lot, there was a lot of publicity for certain um, evangelical or, or conservative Christian pastors who were, who were advocating environmentalism, framing it as creation care, right? And, and, and of course, you know, they, they, you know, they were just doing it quietly within their, uh, within their, in their churches, but the postmodernists jumped all over it, like, oh, like, this is it, let's integrate that. And, um, I, you know, I think that's, um, you know, that's really worthy, but because it was somewhat artificial, there's still ways in which, you know, Traditionalists, many of them, love nature, right? They love the environment. Conservation, right, is a fundamental principle of conservatism, right? The, the reason they resist the environmental movement, again, this is largely subconscious, right? But the reason they resist it is because it's, it's green, it's postmodern, right? And postmodernism is, in a sense, you know, a direct threat to their identity, right? So anything that, you know, whatever is dear to the hearts of postmodernists, they want to poke that in the eye, right? And so until, until the environmental movement takes a look in the mirror and sees how its own anti-modernism is, is hijacking its political potency, um, you know, then, then I think we're going to still be stuck in our, you know, this urgent effort to try to uh, overcome and ameliorate global warming. So again, it's, these are cultural issues and the resistance is how do we integrate the values? Well, we stop um, trying to dissolve that culture or seeing it only for the bad. And it's only by this larger cultural process that we'll begin to find the empathy we need to persuade these people to get on board with uh, ameliorating climate change. Sure. Okay, well, so please come to my workshop tomorrow at 3 if you can. We'll talk about this some more and then plus some other slices of culture. Appreciate it.